Now we're on. Okay. This is session two. So like I said, prior to um, breaking for session one, geared towards our current and new act sites, we'll get into some nitty gritty. And after we get back here around two o'clock following lunch, will be opportunity to have uh, more conversation as opposed to just us talking to you and feeding you information. So i um, excited about that and really excited to be up here talking to you face to face as opposed to over the phone or via email. So it's really nice to finally in person meet a lot of you folks that um, between Vince and myself, we've been interacting with you for the past couple of years. So before, um, as we kick off here and before we get into the fun things we're going to talk about today. I just want to orient us to what it is we're looking to get out of our, our second session here today. So quickly, I want to review our activity for the rest of 2018. I know we uh, in the earlier session went through a, a high level timeline. So I want to talk in a little bit more depth what we're planning uh, across all of our, um, uh, our tiers for 2018 also give you perspective so that you, you better understand the current state of the ACT network. So we have uh, Mark, who's going to be speaking to all of you about that in network operations. Then when we get back from lunch, uh, we're gonna have more of an open conversation, discuss best practices, and we have our, our I2B2 folks that are going to help orient us into thinking like a production network. So what it's going to take for us to begin or continue to productionalize our ACT nodes. And then we're going to pick back up with our I2B2 plugin conversation around the technology for participant identification so we can look at what we can expect in, in 2019 and beyond. So I'm not going to go through this in, in too much detail again here, but uh, you know, just a, a high level view as to what's going on across our waves one, two, three, four, and beyond throughout the rest of 2018 and then 2019 and beyond, just highlighting our dissemination activities joining and onboarding to the network, and then rolling out the I2B2 plugins. But what I do want to talk about more specifically is our goals for 2018. So I know it's a lot of words on the slide here, and um, this shouldn't come as totally new information for all of you, but I know sometimes, depending upon what wave or what tier your, your institution currently is, is participating in at the moment, you might not have the visibility into what's going on for uh, some of the other nodes here on the network. So um, throughout the summer, we're going to be promoting our wave three sites to the ACT production network. So those are the sites that uh, are currently participating in our staging network. They're going to move on to production and then focus on dissemination activities. Wave four, we're going to kick off uh, our implementation in August here and, and complete that technical part of our, our act onboarding throughout the calendar year. We're going to continue our dissemination efforts across our wave one and two sites. And then once wave three sites are introduced to production, we're going to kick off dissemination and roll out to end users uh, then and do that by the end of the year. So we have a lot of goals um, in the next six months here. We're going to upgrade to Shrine 1.25.4, I believe, is the version we're moving to. This was just rolled out to our test network, so our four pilot sites the other week. So they've been going through the process of installing it and providing any feedback so we can work out any tweaks before rolling out to staging and production. Uh, we're going to expand our current test and staging networks. I know a question was brought up in the last session about uh, having a non-production node, which of course we, we absolutely recommend and something to keep in mind for our wave four sites as you're standing up your instances. And we'll be talking through how you can connect and participate in our test network or connect to stage so that you have uh, the opportunity to you know, follow best practice and go through any new installs there prior to moving into production. Um, talk a little bit more about that later. We will move to a new version of the ACT ontology, date and version TBD. I know right now a lot of you um, have seen the emails come through about doing a, a very minor upgrade over the next couple of weeks. Um, so this is a more, a much larger uh, and a little bit more disruptive ontology update that we have planned. Um, but more information will come, but it's it's going to be exciting. There's a lot of work behind it, but it's it's really going to provide our users with um, the ability to query across many, many more terms than what are currently available in the ACT ontology. 
as Vivian and, and Sean were talking to earlier, we were demonstrating the I2B2 plugin technology in the ACT test network. So our, our four pilot sites have actually already installed the technology, but we're going to continue uh, making refinements across the test network prior to our rollout in 2019. And then defining and distributing the regulatory and guidance um, uh, or regulatory and governance guidance for participant identification. As was mentioned, the actual identification will be done locally, but we still want to make sure from a regulatory and a governance standpoint, we're accounting for everything that you're going to need to know whenever you go through and roll out the technology locally. All right, so what does this actually look like? It's much prettier in color, right? So um, I uh, want to give you just some perspective as to when this is happening or scheduled to happen. You can't see it at the very end, but most importantly, note that timing is subject to change. That's why I was hesitant to put actual dates on here, but the months are, are you can plan for these, these months here, but um, you'll see the colors representing what tier of the network this activity is happening in. Green represents all tiers. Um, so again, just everything that we went through in the previous slide mapped out across the next couple of months here. Um, so you can see that activity that uh, we have scheduled to start and hopefully wrap up by the end of the calendar year. So I can absolutely make this available following this meeting so that you can um, have it for reference. Yes. Development and the dissemination of the act ontology, sort of as it's occurring, um, and opportunities for community input and such. Certainly. So I know we've been talking about it in our monthly data harmonization workgroup calls, which we've we've had on and off. Uh, they meet the first Monday of each month. So this. This ontology has been in development for uh, quite some time. Michelle can, <laughs> Michelle's gonna, gonna talk more to some of the details here a little bit later, but we do have a test server as well that I can, I can make that information available so you can actually see what that ontology is and, and take a moment to orient yourself to that. Um, I know we also have a um, couple of surveys that have gone out uh, through the data harmonization work group. I don't think that's going to be, that That will probably be down the road, some of the input from those surveys for a future ontology release, not what we have planned for this year, um, but I'm not going to steal Michelle's thunder. I'll let her talk, talk to that here uh, in, in just a little bit, but does that sort of help answer your question? Okay, all right. Any other questions on the timeline before we move on to why you're all here today? All right, excellent. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mark to walk you through network operations. Okay. So um, we covered so far kind of why Act kind of Vivian and Sean, you know, what organizations are in it, what it is now and what it will be, thanks to the and Doug, and when things will um, happen. I'm gonna go through and glad I'm the first of these next three sessions because it's probably maybe one of the more mundane things. You know, this is like hosting and kind of stuff. And I want to start out by just asking for a show of hands. Who here is from a site in wave one or two? How about wave three? All right. How about neither or don't know? Okay, we'll go into it again. All right. Oh, four. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to four as well. Wave right. four. Yes, wave four. Anyone else? I know. All right. So I'm going to talk about this. There's an update you need to have one in front of you. I want to help you understand a lot of the process that I'm going to talk about are things that we, I'm going to talk about what we have right now, and uh, we'll also mention that some of these things will change or be improved in the future. Um, so let me, did I get me to advance here? I, I can't, it's, it's up to you. Okay. Um, let me just introduce the concept of the network operations group. So we realized, uh, Doug sort of mentioned that the fact that we have to juggle and manage I2B2 versions, shrine versions, ontology, 
things like data processes and maintenance, all of this requires some level of coordination. So there is now a network operations group that sort of came about just out of necessity. Um, this group sort of will help coordinate those different activities as they happen across the different tiers and um, will help just make sure that we are rolling things out at the right time so that we keep things in a, a good shape for users and we keep us moving forward with the technology. Um, we'll also do some monitoring that I'll talk about and also be disseminating some things around best practices. Um, and if necessary, we would escalate issues if there were major production issues or things that we needed to change course on. Um, the network operations group might be the first place that that gets discussed. Um, but let me start up to talking about terminology. Um, I think we sort of covered the idea that there is a hub and spoke that apologies to the network with a hub um, and that there are sites or downstream nodes or instances of the software at sites in the ACT network. Um, so these are the local installations of I2B2 Shrine with the ontology and your local data and then a centrally managed hub. And Sam Choi over here, uh, so I think a lot of you might know or have interacted with, um, manages those whoop, manages those hubs. Um, we've also got three networks, which I think Doug mentioned, production, stage, and test. So I'll go into a little more detail there. Yeah. So, um, so the different sites, mm -hmm. in earlier slides, we saw them referred to as hubs also. Yeah. Are they actually set up as hubs or are they just called hubs right now? Yeah, they're called the CTSA hubs. I think it's a term that gets used. Correct. CTSA hubs. Yeah, but yeah. from a sort of technical standpoint, they are nodes on your, on on your network. network. Exactly. Yep. The network is a collection of nodes, downstream nodes, instances that all attach to a single hub. So that's where it gets confused. So there's an ACT hub, there's one ACT hub per network. And multiple. CTSA hubs that are nodes on your network. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that exactly that's what we want to get across. That's what gets real confusing. Um, and that does play into um, configuration of the software. So it's really it's important that people know, yes, they are a CTSA hub for folks on the phone. I'm making air quotes, but you are a downstream node in that network. And there are three networks that we have at this point. So production. Of course, is where we want to have high reliability, high data quality. This is where we have users, end users, actually querying the network. Um, right now, just waves one and two. Um, and then we'll have, we have sort of a phased process that you've seen of opening it up to end users. Stage network, first and primary purpose is for sites that are joining the network. These downstream nodes, before they're on production, join up to stage, and then are promoted to production. Secondary purpose here is for this to be sort of a practice instance. If you have a, a non-production node that you want to hook up to a, uh, a hub, to a network, this is where you can do it. Um, this is never open to end users. And right now, there's the Wave 3 sites. Test network. Right now, just four sites connected. Um, again, not open to end users. A lot of times, the test network will be in a different version of ontology, software, et cetera, and the stage or production networks, because this is where we're sort of doing acceptance testing, if you will, for the network or say software that's coming out to make sure that it's gonna work and it's gonna meet the needs of the network before we put it out, push it out further. Um, we also have to thank the test sites that are on the network because they help us also gauge um, how difficult it's gonna be to install. If there's any questions, they help us refine our installation instructions, that sort of thing. So the test network is important to us. Um, we are open to further participants on the test network if you're able to help out that way. Um, and as we mentioned, we do strongly encourage sites to have a non-production network after they join production, either on stage or on test. Um, test, as we said, is where you can help us out by trying out the software, um, giving us feedback, that sort of thing. Stage, it's you're sort of more on your own. You're free to use that as a practice instance, but um, we're not gonna be looking to you for early feedback in that case. But it's your choice where you wanna have your non-production instance. Now, uh, monitoring. 
we just sort of started sharing some with the stage network. We've done this for production. Um, this will evolve in time. Um, right now, Sam runs a weekly query. We've got sort of a sample of it here from production. And we hope to develop tools in the near term that will do this in a more automated manner. What you're seeing here is a slice of what we call the smoke test. Um, nine queries. They we chose terms here that we thought should be relatively trouble-free, like you know, gonna see them in a bit, Tylenol. Is it possible that there's an institution that has never used Tylenol? Yes. Is it likely? No. So our expectation is that all of these queries should return counts unless there's some quirk of your data or institution you could let us know about uh, where you might have 10 patients or fewer for some reason, or you could see results weren't available at that particular time. So this would go out weekly, and we ask for sites to look at this, and if there are problems here, to please address them. Um, we do want you to maintain you know, a sense of a, a, just sort of a situational awareness of your connection to the network, um, even independent of this weekly test. But this is just one opportunity for us to give you a reflection back of how your site is doing at one point in time during the week. Um, enlarged to show detail, um, I'm showing here 10 patients or fewer. Is this, a, is this possibly true? Maybe, um, you know, depending on if you have ICD-9, ICD-10. But we, again, we sort of expected that these would all be green. Um, and we also want you to address problem spots, and those are usually in red text here. So results aren't available. You know, why did this particular query take this longer period of time? Um, these are where you should be investigating when you see these. So a very small number of patients should make you go scratch your chin. Or if results weren't available, there was some other error. Also something to look at. Um, you can also, too, if you need assistance, we have a help desk JIRA system at University of Pittsburgh. Um, we're going to be using that for taking questions and filtering them through to whoever might be able to help you with it. Yes? I'm, I'm wondering if in your future plans, by the way, this has been great, really helpful for us to monitor ours. But I wonder if there's um, sort of with the caveat and the knowledge that uh, there's, a, there's a fair amount of head heterogeneity across our yeah. different institutions uh, and hospitals. Um, I wonder if we might be able in the future to get a little bit more granular rather than just sort of count return, but I wonder if there's a way that we can more, um, if we can benchmark just a little bit and give us maybe an indication if we've got a data quality problem at our site. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's, it's you're only going to be able to get so fine, but um, there might be an opportunity rather than just to count what is it. Um, and be able to, to maybe investigate based on that. Yeah, but I think the other thing, the other way this can be improved too, but it requires a more of a longitudinal view is to see how that changes over time. Yeah, right. And it was just going up, like, why would this go down? Yeah. Um, so there is there's definitely more opportunity in that. But we don't want to, I think the, the line that we're sort of walking here is we're looking at connectivity. And this is sort of an extension of just are people connected? Do they have data loaded at a very sort of gross level? We're sort of walking this line between data characterization and you know, ontology and that sort of effort and just straight up connectivity. Is the network all connected properly? So, um, I take your point though, that, that maybe that level of granularity deeper might be interesting. <laughs> yeah, and I think actually, probably of interest to our users and probably our funders as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as I think we talked a little bit earlier, we do have a data characterization survey that's going on to kind of get a sense for what data are expected at different sites. And we're also looking to make the results of that available to end users in some way, shape, or form in the future. So that if they see something that's sort of confusing, or you know, my goodness, why don't they have more of these patients in the Children's Hospital? You know, and sort of additional phase of data characterization, I think, is where what you're talking about with the fit, rather than just like connectivity and data present absence, especially with the data here, and I think. Following the data characterization, like broad survey, there's room to get granular and do a lot more. And there's been sort of that's to come, but I think it's very much makes sense to do. Yeah. And you think you've got accounts in your kind of views also on how about how much things want to So, yeah, time to return, that's also something you could look at doing. Um, you know, that can be variable across time, but that's another component. Because the overall time is the top. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so right now it's it's kind of like a surface level uh, kind of monitoring. We want to make sure as part of the onboarding efforts of, of sites to make sure that they are returning account. Uh, we don't want to see any errors. And also, if there's something yellow, you know, is that expected? Uh, if it is, then fine. You know, uh, we'll we'll you know move on to the next part. Uh, but yes, something later down the line, we can get more granular in terms of actually including the counts. And then, as what we mentioned before, when the next version of the software goes out, you know, the query time isn't that relevant anymore because all the queries will be coming back asynchronously. So then uh, results come back as they, as they come. So if you are still concerned about how your individual site is performing, you know, we as the hub can have further insight into how long it took for your site to, to return for that particular query. So, uh, so this is just kind of like a preliminary monitoring effort. Uh, and Mark mentioned that we're going to try to automate a lot of these functions so that I don't have to do it every week or, you know, we can expand on what this initial test describes and add more granularity or more variety to it as well. And the reason I want to call this sort of shared monitor, I mean, this is, this is sort of giving a snapshot at one point in the week. Um, you know, I really am encouraging all sites to try to be aware of performance issues, to solicit feedback from your end users, to do some queries yourself uh, to understand the performance as well. Uh, like I say, this is just a snapshot, and so it really does require um, the folks in the room that are sort of hands-on keyboard at the sites to be trying to keep an eye on this as well, uh, if you can. Um, and like I said, we'll, once a week, we'll try to give you an indication of this, but it shouldn't be your only indication of health. Be that's it would be a good way to go too. Yeah, yeah. So there's I think there's a lot of possibilities here. I think we're just we're started of just developing it. Sorry, did you have something? To, no. Did you volunteer? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> oh, all right. Thank you, Jay. Duly noted. Um, Doug mentioned we have a network maintenance window that we're trying to adhere to. Uh, again, just because we now have end users, we're starting to have end users, and we're just trying to keep the network, the production network, um, at a, a good place for users. Um, 4 p.m. Tuesday Eastern to 7 a.m. Wednesday is more asking people to try to confine any um, churn in the network to that time. There may be times when Elena will ask you to do something outside of that, or um, we acknowledge that something might go beyond that, that window. That's fine, but we're just trying to keep things as, as contained as possible so we can communicate to end users. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing too is that we do have some mailing lists that I'll get to. You know, you may also, if there's something that's going to happen either during this window or outside of it, try to let the rest of the network know. Um, so there's a mailing list that you can use. So like what you plan to do, what change you know you expect there to be, or what the, the downtime should look like. Um, is useful for us to know just that if we get someone saying, you know, oh, this is, you know, I'm seeing this, we can say, yep, you know, we were sort of aware of that already. Uh, so communication channels, we've got an act mailing list. Um, if you're not familiar with these, we can get you familiar with them. Um, we also do some direct communication. So there may be times, I'm thinking especially for wave three or wave four, when we might ask you to use the JIRA help desk, or we may say, listen, you know, there is a time crunch going on, like just work with Sam and copy Elena and myself on it. Um, and then we also have the ACT help desk. And again, it's easy to track, but that requires some maintenance on its own. So um, we're trying to get a feel for how to be efficient, but also track what we're doing, make sure that nobody sort of falls through the cracks and then we don't support you, um, but also getting things done when we need to. Um, help desk here, there is, I think we're doing one login per site, is that yep. correct? Okay. Yep, in week four sites, we're in the process of expanding our, our zero license. We don't have enough right now for all of our week four sites, but um, as soon as we finalize all of the contractual fun stuff there, um, we'll be um, onboarding one user from your institutions as well to the help desk. So. Yeah, so waves one and two and three, um, I think you, if you don't know who the person is that has access to the help desk, find out a uh, way for that will be coming and it, just to clarify this isn't open to end users so we're not expecting that you would send end users to this help desk 
we want the end users to be helped locally to have a face for the act network at the site where they can um, get help if something is beyond your understanding or ability then you might consider using the mailing list or the help desk uh, let's see so going forward um, we are going to be having a larger production network we've mentioned that we're going to be having a test and rollout of a shrine release um, continuing to work with the data harmonization, dissemination work group, technology work group, really to have sort of a production ready, and we'll talk more about that, um, high quality network, and then maybe do some more work with network monitoring and do things in a more automated fashion because Sam is a busy man and uh, it's not nothing to be doing those tests. I also just want to run through really quickly, especially probably for Wave 4 sites, that there are um, site functions that I want to run through these are functions not necessarily mapping to a single person. So there might be multiple functions um, performed by a single person, or there might be sort of a shared responsibility for some of these functions. But we expect that every site there's going to be a sysadmin. This is the person that would be hands on keyboard doing things like, you know, um, installing updates of software, that kind of thing. We also work closely with a, a site operations coordinator down here who might be our main point of contact, um, and also perhaps somebody who was involved with the data. Um, so this admin, set operations coordinator, uh, there may be so the function of a research data curator, so somebody who really knows about the data and why things might be a certain way because of the EHR or historical nuances of the data. Um, we would need someone who's sort of aware of that. We need a data steward, so this is somebody who helps monitor the use of the network by your own users. So it's site monitoring the usage of the network by their site. Um, and then also a dissemination lead. So the dissemination work group works with, uh, yeah, sorry, this is kind of far down here. Um, dissemination work group will work with one person or a, a group of people in order to roll out two end users at the site. So I just want to make you aware of those different functions. Like I said, it could be one person, could be many, but these are the roles or the functions we expect to exist at a given site. So it's kind of a lightning round of a lot of stuff. Anybody have any questions we can answer at this point about those? Because if not, I think I'm turning over to Nish. Thanks. So the one thing I would ask is that you say you never computer because when you want to throw away from it, it's hard to get Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> This is good. <laughs> so my name is Nish Wadanasin. I've been working with the I2P2 team for quite a while. Um, I'm part of the team here that's sitting over here for Swati, Vivian, Jay, and Rita, and Mark over there that are responsible for developing some of the software for phase two, which you'll hear about after lunch. So I just want to give some technology overview, um, try to demystify some of the confusion about how things connect together. I'm probably going to end up confusing you even more, <laughs> but continue. So this is the, the third time you've been here since this morning, the third time you've seen this map. Uh, <laughs> It's a great map, right? <laughs> but I want to show the significance um, of the centralized shrine hub. So this is the one act shrine hub that exists. Um, this is quite important because essentially the communication takes place between the sites and the hub. And I'll um, show you about the communication in detail in the next couple slides. So as uh, Mark mentioned, this is the, of course, the hub and spoke network topology. Um, but I'm going to hone in on essentially just one site and the communication to the hub and try to answer essentially two questions. Uh, what happens when someone at your site submits a query? And how does your site respond to incoming queries from other sites or either from your, from your own site? So zooming into just your site alone, of course, um, 
if you're an assessment, you have Shrine and you have ITV2 installed. So this is very, a very simplified slide about um, the various components. There's many more configurations and components um, at each site. But here, of course, you have ITV2, and this is where your EHR data is. Um, that EHR data can be queried by your local ontology. We'll go into more of that. Uh, Shrine has, of course, the network ontology. This is the common ontology um, that Michelle works on. She'll talk more about that. And this is the ontology that essentially you don't make edits to. Everyone in the network, um, an investigator at any site using the Shrine web client will see the same ontology. Uh, at this point in phase one, this is in the Shrine world, this is kind of where your local users live. So your Shrine project, and I'll kind of try to go into that a little, in, in a little detail, but um, your Shrine essentially has, has a set, set of users. Uh, the Shrine is getting a little technical, but it has the query entry point, and this allows you to, your Shrine, uh, node to communicate with the Act Hub, and of course the adapter that was mentioned before, allowing the Act Hub to communicate back with your node. And so really this thing boils down to two functions that I mentioned before that um, I'll talk more about sending a query, so what happens in that function, and of course being able to respond to a query. So this is kind of the typical setup um, that you'll see at your site. Um, of course, you're familiar with um, some of the components here. You have your site will have a Shrine web client uh, connected to an I2B2 project management cell. Uh, there's the, and here you have a project for Shrine. The project contains a network ontology that doesn't change. Of course, it represents the, the act ontology. Um, as Doug mentioned, there's previous queries. This project, what's important about it is that your patient data doesn't live here. Your patient data lives in your I2B2 project. And I'll try to give the difference between that later. And of course, this is your set of users. And then here, the dotted line there is the, the firewall between your site and the Shrine Hub. Oh, yes. Uh, no problem. The Shrine users always have data aggregation and data office. Is that hard coded in there or is that something you have to make sure that? Sam, maybe you can. When you create a new user, it, it's checked out by default. By default, okay. Yes. Right. okay. So, a lot of my next slides just have a bunch of animations to try to eliminate how much I actually talk and make mistakes. Uh, so I give this simple example here. Um, John over here, he logs into the Shrine web client. And you can see here, this is the, the login and his login here is authenticated against the ITV2 project man management cell. And you know the, the Shrine web client uh, is displayed to him. Uh, so let's say a very simple example is that John wants to find the number of patients uh, with a diagnosis of asthma uh, across the app network. So essentially he formulates his query as everyone you know, pretty understands, um, dragging, finding asthma in the ontology and dragging over it to formulate his query. So this is just one concept in the panel. The query you know, makes its way through I2B2 to the Shrine query entry point, connects to the hub, and then essentially the hub broadcasts that query out to all the known participating sites in the network. So on the flip side, what happens after that query gets broadcasted? So this is responding to a query. Um, so every participating site on the network, if they're up at the time, receives that query at their Shrine adapter. And as you can see, this is the concept that represents asthma comes in. Um, there's this one-to-one -one mapping strategy that you've probably heard about. There's a lot of there's discussion about how that works, and Michelle will go into more detail in, <laughs> in her next uh, oh, but I'll, I'll, I have a couple slides on just how that works. So that strategy of one-to-one -one mapping comes in, and so this at this point, this just wanted to highlight and emphasize that John's account is no longer 
running that query to receive to, to receive the results, right? Because of course, John's account is not known across the network. So what happens is that that query now um, uses a dedicated Shrine service account. So this is just part of the configurations when you're setting up Shrine to run that query on John's behalf. So you can see just, it's a computer. And this computer now logs in, this Shrine service account logs into the project management cell to take that query, query your I2B2 CRC, your big patient data over here, coming back with an aggregate count at, you, at your local site or at one site. And you can see here, it's just 1.2 million patients. That results gets sent back to the Shrine Hub. And on the next slide, you'll see with all the other sites um, in real time, as we discussed, and those results are displayed back to the originating investigator who made the query. So this is just a couple slides I threw in here just, just to discuss one-to-one -one mapping, but um, there's a lot more details that you know we discussed offline. So why is there that one-to-one -one mapping thing to begin with? So of course you have here the I2B2 ontology, um, or sorry, the ACT ontology. And as you are probably aware, that ACT ontology is represented by these paths. So this is these are these um, hierarchical paths. You can think of them been connected. You can think of them as a uh, like a like a file system in, in a tree. So so all these folder folders that you see here on the left are represented by unique paths on the right. So this is kind of what it looks like in your database. So the one to one mapping is important because you have for your shrine instance for your shrine um, project, you'll have this act ontology loaded. And this is, and you don't actually make any modifications to this ontology. But when your act ontology is at your local site, you might want to put other things. And this is just one of the mapping strategies. It's just one of the ETL strategies you can use at your site. So you might, for example, when this query came in, this is the path that represents asthma. So it's underneath you know, diagnoses, diseases, or respiratory system, um, chronic lower respiratory and then asthma. So this query comes in to every site. Now, when it comes into a local site, let's just say for whatever reason, at your local site, there's local codes that represent asthma that you might, of course, that represent those patients at your local site that you wanna include to make sure that, that those patients are received and serviced by that query. So at your local institution, you might want to put those local codes underneath you know, basically hide them, fit them into your act ontology. No, that makes sense, but okay. So in summary, um, just kind of putting everything together, this is essentially what it looks like, you know, typically at a site. So this is a partners and your setup kind of looks something like this. And then there's this, Long animation where, of course, the user logs in here, um, formulates this query, runs it, it gets submitted to the Shrine Hub. Shrine Hub broadcasts it to all the different sites. Of course, it's received at the same Shrine adapter at your local site. Um, the Shrine service account logs in and runs that query on behalf of the investigator in real time, receiving aggregate counts to the Shrine Hub. And of course, the Shrine Hub returns all of the counts in real time back to the investigator. So simple. All right, I'm not, I'm not talking one more time. I'm just gonna, so this guy does this and it goes over here and. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's all being recorded. Oh, goodness. <laughs> okay, so yeah, as you can see, this is what happens on one side, and then this is happening in every site that's connected. Small <laughs> Now Michelle's up to just correct everything I've said. No. <laughs> so this is 
All right, so I'm going to do the ontology. There's no animation. I don't even know how to make this move. Okay. All right, so I can start. Right. Okay, so first we just want to highlight the background to the ontology for the ACT ontology. The ACT ontology is um, led by the Data Harmonization Work Group. They kind of figure out what's going to be in the ontology and when it should go in. Um, that group's led by Sean versus Warren. There are actually four subgroups, but I lead one that I've never met with, so I only put the ones that exist. So Deb Batson, I guess, is leading the lab subgroup, which is, I think, the most active subgroup. And then the general subgroup, uh, Sean meets with them the first Monday of each month. Um, the, I don't know why I put this one line here, but from now going forward, we're going to be using the wiki to distribute the files. We've gone all different kind of ways. We've done box, we've done true centrics, we've done uh, emails, but I think so what we're going to do now is we're going to repurpose the ACT wiki, which will give you the link to, and that's how the files will be distributed in the future. Um, the goals for the ontology. Um, Oh, okay, so mainly what we're trying to do is get the baseline of all the things that are most commonly available readily at all the different sites to just get a baseline ontology. So your labs, your meds, your diagnosis and your procedures, your demographics and some visit details. So that's kind of what's guiding what's going into the version one and, and the next version of the ontology. Um, We've talked a lot about the shrine ontology being the one that you should not change. And one of the reasons why Niche did that um, animation and the thing that we're really trying to drive home is that we really want people to have the shrine ontology and their local ontology. Because I talked to a lot of sites and we've some sites have been short circuiting the process and just pointing their shrine instance to their I2B2 ontology. And you can run into some troubles when you do that. And it also takes away some of the flexibility that you have and that the network has to kind of move things into production without upsetting the entire network. Um, and then the, at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the data characterization survey. Uh-oh. Oh, it says Mosey Home. Jimmy, help me. Um, so this is just an overview of what's in the ontology. The stuff in the red are the things that are going to be in the new ontology. Um, for diagnosis, we do have that 10-9 hybrid ontology, which we're also going to add a 10 ontology that is just straight ICD-10s um, throughout, and it'll be in a later version of UMLS, because I believe the one that's in there now is from 2015, so it's missing a few terms. Um, and then CPT-4 gets special to note because I, um, we're still kind of working out how we're allowed to deliver it, but right now we're only going to provide the CPT-4 ontology to sites that can document that they have a CP24 license. Uh, okay, so where are we now? Okay, we've been going round and round on going to the new ontology. We were really close to releasing it and then we kind of pulled back because we decided that we wanted to add more um, sites to the network before we expand the ontology. So um, where we're at right now is that the production sites are on version one of the ontology and it has modifiers in production um, diagnosis labs and meds and over the next couple of weeks what we're going to be doing is moving to some hybrid of the version one ontology depending on where you are right now um, the production sites are just going to run a little bit of update statements to remove the modifiers. And because what we're trying to do is minimize the disruption from going from version one of the ontology to going to the new ontology. 
and the modifiers are different in the two ontologies. So what we decided to do is disable the ones that are in the version one ontology so that the wave three and wave four sites that have been doing their ETL towards the new ontology won't have to do any work that's gonna get thrown away. Yes, sir. Say it again. An active med. An active med. So in the new ontology, which I'll show you now, the, I mean, a little in a couple of slides, I have tried to take care of the inactive meds and add the NDCs. So you'll see it in a couple of slides. Um, but what's important is that wave three sites, if you already have put version one of the ontology on your staging network, you also just have to run a little bit of code to remove the modifiers, but you also will run another little bit of code which is gonna change your diagnosis prefixes to be more specific than what we have in the version one ontology. So in the version one ontology, ICD-9 prefixes are ICD-9 colon and ICD-10 prefixes are ICD-10 colon. In the new ontology, we, because ICD-10s have ICD-10-CM, which are just diagnosis, and then ICD-10-PCS, which are, um, procedures and there's a little bit of overlap in the numbers there. So we want to correct that. And then, so we decided to do it for the IC9s as well. So the way the ontology is going to work is if you're a wave three site, you're going to have prefixes that are good going forward to the new ontology. The production sites are going to have to do that a little bit later. So that's why we have all these different versions because I'm trying to track which path you are taking to get to um, this little endpoint, this little intermediate state. Yeah. Yes, sir. Like it's way before this, you know, you had your IC twin. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we want to add this whole bunch of ontologies to your concept dimension, mm -hmm. right? So you do, so you put those in your concept dimension, so that we can use them in the queries that are coming off of the shrine node, and that's cool. Mm -hmm. But then, we just want to use, then, then you want to go through them and say, okay, I see. So, you know, I use... Uh, ICD9XXX is my prefix and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. And so for ICD9s in there, I'll just, you know, in the column, which is concept underscore CD, use, you know, I'll put that in there. Right. right? That's what, that's what the, these little bit of update statements do on a kind of a. But, but, but it wouldn't be, you're not really updating the fact table. No, you're updating the ontology tables. So I'm just talking about ontology tables. You're not necessarily going to be able to update it with ICD-9 or ICD-10-CM. <gasps> well, like, here's the thing. Using right. ICD-10 XXX. Right, if you are, that's fine. Okay. So, but we had given them an ETL coding guideline that told them to do these things. So they may have already coded to ICD-9-CM, ICD-10-PCS or whatever. So we are trying to align the ontology to what we told them we would be doing for the new ontology. Yes, 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 yes. But the production sites did not. So that's why we're not doing that for them. But what we want is for the Shrine ontology to be able to work for both sets of people, groups. Right, right. But like Michelle said, so if you started from scratch, right, right. they gave you a, a, a guideline to work towards. Great. But if you're like, you, you already have it, then you just slip it's it. It's on you. Cool. You have to figure it out yourself, really. I mean, that's really what I'm saying. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Ajá. Right, because for the new ontology, which this is not, this is the old ontology tweaked just a little bit until wave three and maybe wave four get on the network. The new ontology did have new modifiers and I mean, it has the stuff that's in that guideline thing. Right. Right, that won't get access, correct. Right, because what, what I thought was better was that you do that instead of doing all this ETL that you would actually end up throwing away because the old mod, you would have had to ETL to the old modifiers, right? And then you would have to turn around again and then do the new modifiers. So that's why we're relaxing all the modifiers so that nobody can do a query with a modifier until people are up with the all consistent. You see, does that make sense? Yeah, I, it doesn't. Sure right. Right, right. Yeah, right, but we kind of pause the moving forward a little bit. So, so I'm trying to balance it without making people do a whole lot of rework is what I'm really trying to do. Yes, sir. They might come back. Yes, they're in the they're in the new guideline for the new ontology. There were modifiers in the new ontology. So, if the data harmonization group and all of you are can be a part of it and voice your opinion and decide that you know what as a network we don't want to do any modifiers that would be up to you guys i will not vote on that either way but right now there are modifiers in the new ontology so the the basic ones it's just um diagnosis primary or secondary and the meds are the ones that have the other modifier it's um administered ordered or result i'm not result um what is it? Dispensed. Dispensed, administered, and prescription or ordered. So those are the modifiers that are in the new ontology. If you don't want them, I would suggest you get on that data harm call and vote no modifiers. Or send her a note. Don't send me a note. <laughs> you have until August, she says. Because <laughs> it's really easy to drop modifiers. True. Interest in modifiers? OK. Who wants modifiers? <laughs> I know. So here's the thing which the other thing we'll look at is actually we have some modifiers again in the existing but a lot of people aren't responding to the modifier queries because you know some people just can't get at that data or aren't willing to go to that level of detail of getting at that data so one of the things with the data characterization i think we're also going to look into is you know well, even if we put the modifiers how many of you will be ignoring those queries anyway so is it worth the time for everybody else to do it? Uh-huh. Right. I will say that right now, any of the, I did go back and look at the queries that have gone across the network so far. No one's issued one, except for like somebody who's testing it like me, but no one has issued any modifier queries yet. So, I mean, mentally we all think, oh, you want to know if it's a primary diagnosis or, oh, is it a, you know, ordered lab or uh, order, you know, med, but no one's issuing that type of query. So, I mean, we can say no modifiers. I'm fine with that. Well, we only have two now. So, 
you got two to get rid of if you want to get rid of them. It's not like I'm adding any. So you want to vote again? <laughs> Who's okay either? Okay, well, let's go with that. Who's okay with or without modifier? With either way. Um, so, I mean, I think you guys in skills and you 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 use modifiers heavily. Yeah. Yeah. Because they already data Mm -hmm. We had to put them in. Right. We had to basically we had to replicate exactly what the four net data models said. Right. And so we did. We had the primary and secondary and all these things. Very rarely used. Right. And the reason is, I think that at this stage of the game, at least, people are interested in kind of more broad well, right. high range. level. So they're not really interested in dispense or prescribe. They just want to know did they get the med or not. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Now later on. You know, in your I2B chip. Yeah, then, then it, it, it can become more, you know, discriminatory. But, you, you know, it's interesting. So with all the hype we do sometimes about, you know, the detail and some of the other things, when it really push comes to shove, it's not, it's not as critical in the real world as we would think. Mm -hmm. A lot of times other errors creep in and, and, and swamp, you know, what we're trying to do so that, you know, it's not like whether it was prescribed or dispensed or whatever. It's, you know, was a huge block of patients, you know, not even have meds fed in because the system changed and, you know, I mean, that kind right. of thing, you know. So, I don't know. I, 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 would, I, I would say, I'm actually agreeing with you. Uh, at the local level, we actually find it more are very useful. Mm. The network label, I would agree, we should start from the local uh, data and the lowest right. to, to begin with. And maybe, depending on the use case, we can decide to add modifier which one to add. Uh, but I would say, locally, we actually find modifier being used by our investigators, most, at least the most sophisticated one. Right. Okay. So, you know, so we could right. do that too, right? We can make it so that the shrine ontology does not have the modifiers and leave them in on the other one so that if people want to take advantage of that work that we've already done, they can use it in their local um, without yeah. it causing a problem, right? Yeah. And that's again, why I want you to make sure you have two on sets of ontology tables. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so. Oh, do I want to say what I'm That is a modifier. Oh, that's a modifier group. So a modifier, and and that's an. Oh no, that's another thing. Um, a modifier is like primary diagnosis versus secondary diagnosis, and so when you drag it from, you know, into the window, it's only gonna get the facts that have that modifier column that matches what you drag, drug, dragged in. I don't know what the past tense is. So um, I don't have a real picture of it, though, but I'm guessing you guys know what modifiers are. So, okay, so, so the consensus kind of is we probably don't want modifiers in the shrine ontology, but we could potentially leave them in the local ontology but we will let you guys go back and vote for real because there's some people who aren't here that might be the whole modifier supporting contingent that aren't here and they might want to vote so um we'll we'll take that to the data harm group but i really think you guys should you know be a part of that data harm group and, and have your voice heard and and because or else it'll just be my voice <laughs> And if you're not, but you're interested, I know for a lot of our way before site, we haven't really talked much at all yet. So if this is new to you, um, send me an email. I own all of those meeting invitations left with me. So I'm happy to add you to the group. And then um, I think a lot of you have my contact information, but if not, I will leave my cards over on that table back there. So when we break for lunch, feel free to pick up a card and send me a note either for 
um, you know, if you're if you're interested in participating in our monthly uh, data monetization work group calls. And if you have anything you'd like to take back to the group, anything you want to make sure you don't lose or forget uh, in the interim, send me a note and I'll make sure that we, we keep track of that. Okay, so I kind of got the ontologies down to a science at this point. All of this pausing and going back and forth allowed me to rewrite this over and over and over again. So basically now I have whittled it down to two scripts. One script that can pretty much generate any I2B2 ontology from UMLS, as long as there's a hierarchy in the MR hire table. And the other is the MED ontology, which I do use RxNav API to build. So, um, so this is what our new ontology has in it. It'll still have the same demographics, the ICD-10 and 9, the old small, um, like hand curated laboratory set of tests, the old visit details, we will add a new ICD-10 tree. We modified the ICD-9 tree so it looks a little bit different. Just we've moved the codes to the front so it sorts by the code instead of alphabetically. Um, we have this full lab like list um, that we use the, um, so it's from UMLS. It uses, I think, the multi-axial hierarchy that Link puts out. And then we have the drugs by product ingredient, and then the drugs by the VA class. Um, ICD-10 procedures, the CBT-4s, the Higgs picks, and ICD-9 procedures. So I think I just did a couple of the ones that are new. So this is kind of what the CPT-4 looks like. It's sorted alphabetically. If you want to complain about that, now's the time to do it. I can put the code in front. I mean, we've played with all different things to try to see what formatting was easiest for people to look them up. I don't know, from a physician's point of view, do you know CPT codes like you know ICD-9 codes? So alphabetic probably is a little bit easier. Although when you're searching, I actually probably would go to find the terms way. Um, CPT, uh, picks, picks, same thing. Um, this is the lab. So I would say this probably needs the most work because the hierarchy kind of just drops off into all these things which might um, be more than we need. Um, so I think Deb and People are going to have to figure out what the pro proper hierarchy will be for this. But this is our baseline. I think from this, we might be able to get some kind of um, um, data characterization to see what, what codes are actually being used and, and uh, you know, what data we really have and how we can really gather stuff together. But that will be up to the data harm group. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Is there any thought to creating a single concept that would hit all the different points and do whatever groups may be necessary to allow them to use that term and change Right. So I think for in the general case, when you're just measuring presence or not presence, you can pull one of these higher level folders. There might actually be a folder below for me you can pull a higher lo level folder and the query should work because it'll have all of the codes that are, you know, all the versions of A1C underneath mm -hmm. them. The problem only happens when you query by value where you will have to put in all versions of that lab. And like I said, if you work with the, I mean, the data harm group or the lab subgroup is going to have to come up with how that can be best work with. I, I, I don't really have any opinions on it. I don't know how to, any ideas how to improve that. Um, and then these are the two um, med ontologies. We added this one with the products by ingredient. We added the NDCs and then you'll see there'll be like retired um, cooies that'll be integrated with the tree. Um, so hopefully we will have captured the historical, the problem where we had people who had, you know, 
older coded things that the GUIs changed, um, I hopefully caught those. So we'll, again, I will have to do a little bit more characterization on it and see what my coverage is and make sure that I got as much as I can. And then, so from the SDD level on down or S, no, SCDF level, which is like this, the injection or oral tablet level, these two will, should look about the same because I use the same script to generate it. So, but this should have more in it than what's just in the VA formulary, which that one, the, um, the, the drugs by class should. Um, that's what's in that tree. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I do some capitalization in there. So, so. <laughs> But yeah, so these are just five months. Um, and then this was just, again, when you're doing the installation of the ontology, just to stress, two separate things. You can put some other things in your ontology tables at the local level. I think there's a lot of tricks and things that people do. I don't know if, who's Robert Bradford? Oh, that's you. I should have known it was you. <laughs> I think he has some tips and tricks of how he handles his. There's somebody else who has some other tips and tricks. And hopefully during the second half, people can kind of share some of those things with everybody that, you know, some more people who are more novices that learn from um, to map, you know, do some mappings where you don't have to do full copies of your data set over and over, stuff like that. So, um, and then just to we are pretty much saying do the adapter mapping one to one. It, I think it just seems a little bit easier to keep track of and debug to actually change your local ontology tables versus this file because this is a text file and it, it could get a little bit unruly. Yes, it'll work. Yeah, no, 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 not that it won't work. We just, you know, just, we just want to make sure that this one stays clean, okay? Right, right, right. So, and there's a lot of different ways that people are approaching it. So I, I think it'd be cool to hear all the different ways that people are approaching it. Some people have some side mapping tables that are doing in an over top of a view. So I think it'd be interesting to hear how those are happening. Um, and then, oops. So we did the red cap survey with the wave one and two sites answered the questions and then we added a bunch more questions and we are submitting it to the wave three sites. Um, Philip did a lot of work uh, on this and he actually pulled together these spreadsheets. Um, so we're using these for a bunch of different things. One of the things that we're using the survey results from, so the survey is really important because it's gonna help us to build that user facing information to let people know where things are missing. You know, you have some idiosyncrasies at your site. Is your site special? Is it just a children's site? So people shouldn't expect certain data. Um, how often um, your data gets updated, what year your data starts. So these, this data is going to feed into what the dissemination group are going to put together for the users to see. Um, then um, Philip also did a lot of work to use the information to help people kind of debug their site. So he went through and you know put the spreadsheet together, and you can see like right here, this person had you know 157,000. Um, people with diabetes in their EMR, pretty much the same in their I2B2, but then they dropped all the way down to 32,000 in their shrine. So, so Philip worked with some of the sites to try to help them to debug like what's going on with their data. So this also to help you at a technical level. And then, and then this example, it shows you like, here's the modifier, there you go. There's a couple people that are returning with modifiers, but you can see most people are just not doing it. 
So um, that's it. Any questions? Cool. All right. All right. So yeah. Thanks, Mark. So um, we're like right back on time, which is just I'm so excited right now. Um, we're gonna break um, here in a second and then regroup at two o'clock for this part two of our second session today. But Mark, why don't you walk us through yeah. some of our I'll lunch just, options? Let's zoom out from the area. So we are here at Conway Library. Down there, you came in right there. There is a place called Paths that is actually basically in the Brigham Women's Hospital. Um, entrance is right there close to the front door. It's like a counter service, like sandwich shop, like a well seasoned flat top grill if you're looking for something like that. Um, there's a, a food truck over there in that little circle. There's a bar logo, which is burritos, et cetera, um, in that building that's marked parking. And then there's um, over here in the Longwood Galleria, there's sort of a food court with, with fast food types of options. Uh, so those are some of the things around for lunch. And they Access the courtyard cafe too, or I, so these. Yeah, there are a couple of places. But I think you need an ID. I think they expect you to have an ID um, for that. So find a friend. Go yeah, back. you can also find a friend to go to one of those. And then if this is any easier, that's a, that's sort of an aerial view. So we are up there in this box. That's food trolley, a loco gallery. All right, awesome. Cool. Thanks, Mark. We'll see everyone again at two o'clock. Folks who are joining us remotely are uh, back up at the. Uh All of us in the medicine. Hi, my name is Luisa. I'm from the <laughs> 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 Hi, Mark Abadja. Applications leading for clinical research informatics, University of Southern California, wave four. Yay. Yay. Woo. <laughs> All right, Sean. Hello, I'm Mahesh Sangala. I'm a data scientist at UMass Medical School. Susan Velocity, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm a physician and epidemiologist from Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, Matt Bauman, developer at Northwestern University. Rob Shaw, OHSU. I'm Lisa Parchi, same OHSU data analyst. I'm Jeff Klein, I work with Sean and MJ. I'm also a panel of my colleagues for the video. I'm still not with you, Michelle. He's Michelle with the school. on over here to our shrine oh, table. Um, I'm Mark Cerrillo, who introduced myself earlier, project manager here at Mark Dallas. I'm working with Suzanne and Scott. Uh, Stan Troy, uh, part of the shrine team as well over at Harvard University. And uh, a lot of you have heard my name. So. <laughs>
That was helpful and helpful for me. Nice to meet everybody. So I'll turn it over to Jay and talking about productionalizing your act instance. So. Was it space bar? Are you going to the next one? Oh, okay, great. Uh, so my name is Jay and um, we have an inside view of I2B2. So today we're going to point you to resources that we've developed uh, that will allow you to do some um, make productionize your um, act instance. I'll go into more detail. So basically like here once you once you're all set up with I2B2 and um, you've got an ontology it's now, now you're ready to let some users um, into your site. But there's some considerations before. Uh, what do you do about user registration? What do you do about the terms of access that's dictated by ACT, uh, securing your platform, you know, your website, uh, and refreshing your data? Uh, so there's a lot, probably a lot more considerations, but these are the ones we were focusing on today. Uh, registration. Uh, these are like what mandated by ACT again, local ACT users must register to use the software, which is the I2 to uh, Shrine web client. Users must be faculty members or fellows qualified staff working with faculty members. Uh, local sites must come up with their own methods for handling registration. These may be like electronic or manual or a combination. Um, the example we give on our, on our wiki is electronic, automatic. Um, and also that these methods must include auditing who has tried to register, who has registered, and who has logged in, you know, who's accepted the terms of access. Any clarifications needed for yes? No, so um so uh, as a known on the ACT network, we're responsible for registering our own users. We have our own user base. There's no such thing as a centralized ACT registry. No. No. No, so yeah, this is this is this is kind of like what we came across, and like okay, no, we we're responsible for our own site, so like this would be good to share um, with the rest of the sites. Good question. Any other? Uh, yeah. Um, so if I'm so I'm serving up the data, what do I know about the person who issued it? Do they have to go have any training or anything? 
Um, so, oh, so it could be a monkey if you're excited. Well, well, if you can pull a car. So you have to be qualified faculty or a designee of a qualified faculty member performing queries okay. under their supervision. Like but there, there are some sites um, who do mandate a training prior to actually being given access to the tool. I don't think that's a bad idea. But it's up to the local site as to how they actually can. can but there's a fact policy about qualified faculty. There is, correct. Yes. Some faculty could be one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, what's the duration of their uh, eligibility to the network? Once they are given an account, do they have uh, access to the, to the network forever, or is there a, a, a termination period or date? Or, uh, well, for access to Shine queries, you need um, data arrogant, data limit data set. As far as length, I, I, that might be site yeah. specific, right? Site specific, we would recommend a year because understanding that investigators aren't always going to, they're not going to be using it on a regular basis per se, right? So we don't want to run into the frustration of, you know, say, their access is denied if they don't log in after 90 days. Well, having a year before that times out is, is appropriate and sending out reminders. We've implemented something similar at Pitt, if you have um, any questions there, but we'd recommend you know, allowing, um, uh, keeping the, the user active for a year um, without use before they're actually made inactive and need to go through the process again. Yeah, there's one, only one level of access control for a shrine work client, obviously much more so than the IP. Data steward here at HMS 
that work we thought we needed a, a very senior level faculty member who was familiar with queries and all the codes and the systems and so on. And it turned out that that's not that wasn't the case. That someone who had basic familiarity with how the system works and if as long as the query topics were well phrased, it was pretty easy to tell whether somebody was on top of her. As we as we played out collective statistics about off topic queries, so we could have, a, have positive and negative examples of, of such queries. So they're having trained presented for the data stewards. I don't know whether that goes into that level of detail. No, but we, we don't have those statistics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but we're just now we're only talking. But we are expecting that the data stewards across the network will talk to each other and presumably share some of these examples. The, I mean, the main thing we're trying to avoid here is someone, a really bad actor, right? And, and not keeping an eye on their users would allow potentially someone who's a, a bad actor from putting in a phony query topic and then going and querying some pretty sensitive uh, area. So, um, uh, I mean, this is not trying, I mean, for the most part, your legitimate users are Thank you. Um, one of the calls a while back, a few months back, there was examples going through saying these are the types of queries, you know, if you had a stated intent like this, then if you saw something like they show up here, it was kind of a flaw or how you might be trying to work with a limited data set and work backwards in that limited data set. So there should be a recording of that somewhere, I would guess. There is, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, up on YouTube, um, on Pitt's YouTube channel, so we can share the recording to that data steward training. And Mark did a really good job of walking through some examples. And like Michelle said, we don't have any real data yet, but the examples are useful, so I can share that out um, following the day's events so that you have that as reference. And something that um, Wave Free Sites will be gearing up to do as well before we release to end users and other um, data steward training. Yeah, uh, just the comments about the uh, apparent uh, acceptance of students uh, as a use of here. My memory was that earlier on that wasn't maybe a um, uh, use case that we wanted to support, but I do kind of think it's legitimate to make sure our language in the various documents actually includes students. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So I know we talked about residents too. So um, and you'll see, we'll talk about the terms of query access here, but um, again, something that will continue to, to evolve and that we'll need to refine. So there's obviously plenty of gray areas as we go through and we think about um, you know, what it means to be uh, qualified staff working under a qualified faculty member. So thanks, Rob. Thank you. Dr. Mark, could you comment on the ability to turn the auto topic approval on or off and whether or not that's something that should I think it relates to the, yeah, so auto approval at this, at this point, at this juncture, it will be configured to set auto approval on. Correct. So, sites, so individuals using the network will have to create a query topic. And again, we're suggesting that people include enough information there that someone who's looking at their query behavior can make some sort of determination, but that will be approved automatically as opposed to waiting for someone to approve it. Right. So. Why, why would a site want to turn the auto approval off? Why would they want to? Yes. Um, I guess that would, what that would allow the site to do that is to actually have a, a point to approve it <laughs> manually to say, you know, is this something that is understandable to the data stewards? And then decide. The point I was trying to make is that there's yeah. a level of additional security should a site desire to do that. Yeah, I think we, we got to the point where we were having a lot of trouble with getting query topics that were sufficient. If the training wasn't significant enough or people just were not understanding, you could make that step on a site by site basis. Yeah, of course, then if you know, for if your user experience, you need a data steward with this thing. Right. <laughs> when it's, you know, they need to use it in there, it ends up taking a few days for it to get approved. You know, that's just a, that's a usability and a timeliness issue. But it's an option within the software. Um, so, we made a generic user registration page. Uh, 
and we made it available using um, features that are already available in I2B2 um, that you have in your instance, uh, your, web, your I2B2 Shrine web client has this feature. And basically, uh, we make service calls to the PM cell to register a user, add the proper rules, and even um, sync up with your Active Directory um, users. Um, so they can use the same um, username password to get into the, to the Shrine web client. Um, and we publish this on the I2B2 community uh, wiki publicly. Um, you, if you go to the main page, you sort of look for the act software, um, you'll see the, um, well, before that, um, here's an example of this generic form. And these are like the, the um, basically the three fields required by the PM cell for a user registration, just their username. This is kind of grayed out because we took it from the current user, Active Directory, so they can't change it, email address, and their full name. And they would just click on the complete registration form. Again, all this, all the guidance on the software is in the wiki on, how to, on what these forms are and how to do them. Um, but then we complete the registration, an email will go out to the site administrator saying this person tried or was successful in registering, and, they, and the user would get a welcome email saying, welcome to the shrine, here's the URL. So if you bring up this website, just if you have it, you're saying that that will automatically be filled in because of login? Yes, if you, if you want to know how to, in PHP, where to grab the current user login, um, which sometimes is from Active Directory or a local directory access protocol. Um, and then you could even pre-fill the email address and the full name. Um, you can let them change that they want, but we just make sure that they don't change their login if you want to sync. Yeah, and again, all the deets are in the uh, in the wiki. Um, so here's here's a screenshot of the wiki um, that shows you how to create, and it's a, a publicly available and we go over the uh, XML signatures of the request, request response uh, of all the service calls needed to, to get a user to register. And, and we also give code samples, code snippets of PHP of calling those services. And the down, we have a download example as well, fully working. Uh, it comes with a configuration file. You configure in your prime, your PM cell URL and other things like that. Um, and again, it, it, will, it will work if you have PHP installed and, um, and, and the late, but you know, a, a Shrine web client, there's no extra software needed. Yep. For user registration, if we want to do it manually and give people um, access, for example, only if they had a certain kind of account, would they be able to log in with Chivalet? I'm not sure. What what that is. It's like our university, we have single sign-on. Oh, okay. So you use that, and if we could tie that single sign-on to the ACT Shrine login, then our users who are approved to do so would be able to log in with their regular credentials. I'm not sure. Yeah. You, there, there isn't an act login. You, you yeah. make some kind of local determination, and then all the other end of the query knows is that some person from your site is making a query. They don't know who it is. All right, so Mike, Mike is here, so let me explain how this works in I2B2. So in I2B2, the project management cell allows you to have kind of a number of different schemes for holding usernames and passwords. One is it's just got a straight table of usernames. And then the hash password that you can just create manually all your users and all your passwords. And that's one way to authenticate your users. The second way is that you can link it to Active Directory, so Microsoft's Active Directory, LDAP, um, and maybe Shibboleth. And if you can't, you could probably easily get it to do it. I, I can't remember if we do it. Mike isn't here. There was some discussion for him. Here he is. He coming? So Mike would know. Do you guys know? Do you know? You know. There's a Shibboleth discussion before. There was. Yeah. It doesn't. It's not built yet, or is it built? Is there a Shibboleth connector? 
It's being done. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. He's a pure like co-op. He's like open up. Open up. Open up. Open up. Open up. Similar features, but no. Yeah, just an ask a straight username and password. I just uh, uh, authentication. So basically, I mean, so you can go basically to an outside site, but you have to either have it already built into the ICD2 software, which I know we have it for LDAP, and I'm not sure about Shibboleth. I don't think it was officially done. No. Mike may have said playing with it, but from the documentation, the QA standpoint, yeah, thank you. Okay. So, did you put the fire? Did you put the fire app? Copy square. Oh, did you copy to it? Yeah, for the whole app. You guys did the whole app. I think she was like the same concept. Yeah. Where you authenticate Twitter, Facebook, Google, any third party, you can actually direct your authentication. You give their credentials, they give you a callback to allow the token, and you use that token for the session. So that's why you use the authentication and the authorization is on your side. The user authorized to access the same key on your side. Okay, good point. Yeah. So the, the form though that Jay showed, I thought the one thing that, that I thought um, we should we should say over again, Jay, was that um, it relies on active directory, right? That specific form. If it's my example does. Yeah. Um, uh, and one on here, like the one that, that you can go to and Grab as an example of just active directory. Active directory. Um, yeah, so you if one you you would set something called um, parameters, and one of the parameters would be your domain name controller, um, where that where that, what that address is, and, that, and maybe two more, and that's and then you're good to go. Right. Um, yeah. So so if you have Microsoft Active Directory, this works out of the box. That's yes. A, with the domain. With the example, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is anybody here actually running a single sign-on IT services with multiple domain names, 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 um, I went back to the slide too because I forgot to mention that when the PM cell service call will do the auditing of people trying to set up their users. So I wanted to add that that that's included with um, if you use this method. Can you put the slide again? Yeah, the granularity of those, at least the ones that are really done, they ought to do so. So, at least you know, we have some users use just using a password like that. I mean, for some of those, you point out that there was one equal to somebody else. So, yeah, because they're using, because they're, because they're using they're, you can put them on the yeah, user brand, but I'm user brand. Um, terms of access. So these are the rules. Um, local act users must agree to the act terms of access before getting to the data. Um, a suggested terms of access doc has been provided by act. Um, and then local sites again must come up with their own methods of um, how, to, how to get this, this agreement to be signed by the users uh, electronically or manually. Um, and then, of course, the auditing uh, terms of access can be can be tweaked for a site depending on their needs, and also um, each one's unique because certain grant numbers may go into the terms of access. So I want to clarify by tweet. So we have the, the, the app terms of free access, but some sites choose to add additional layer. Um, whether it's restriction or a, an additional layer to the app terms of query access, you can't go through and delete qualified staff or qualified faculty or anything along those lines. So that 
holds true, but a lot of sites prior to um, rolling out to, you know, for, for um, their end users to sign on and, and uh, uh, say that they agree to them may add a couple of additional line items. And that's totally at the, you know, sites are, you're absolutely welcome to do that. And then another thing that I just want to mention is centrally, we don't need this information, but perhaps one of your users is found to be, you know, it's escalated to our, our ACT executive committee that there's a potentially malicious user or some malicious intent somewhere, then we may call upon your institution to show that, yes, this person did sign off on the terms of clearly access. So um, just having that documented really saves us um, you know, from, a, from a government standpoint if anything like that were to happen. Thank you. Um, so again, being close to IGB2 at partners, uh, there is a feature available now on your sites um, to use the announcement feature to put in your term of, terms of access. Um, so basically, when you go to log into the Shrine web client, you'll get the terms of access on a dialog box. And yes, I agree or no, I disagree. They click yes, I agree. Um, if they're logged in, that can be an, uh, an audit point. They, yeah, this person logged in, they click yes, I agree. No. Um, I disagree, um, brings them back to a blank login box. Um, and they must accept the terms before uh, proceeding to the Shrine web client. And the details again are on the public wiki. Um, we went into great detail on how to do this, which is, uh, here's the end result for, for, for partners. Um, it's real basic HTML, and then the button, um, Disagree, no disagree are, are there. So basically a few divs, unordered list. And then the wiki um, goes step by step on, on how to how to do this with, with no tools really needed. Uh, basically you create a simple HTML. I kind of followed the Word doc and made it look like it using HTML. Some encoding, you have to get rid of the less than signs and stuff. Uh, and make it all in one line. Then there's a P, another PM service call um, that you feed this blob of HTML to and um, it checks off, turn on announcement and it works. And, and all, everything you need in this, in, in, this, in this guide that we wrote. So can you explain to me the flaws of, this comes before the after, after they can turn login? After they do that other thing you showed before? Right. So the, the terms, this should be all set to go before you start letting users in. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so what do they see first? Um, so once, you mean once they're registered? No, that's what I'm trying to understand. Like, so, so they go, they, they see this first. Yeah, they see this first if they're not registered. Uh, they, they, and they, um, we, we, you know, we do some checks, uh, partners, are they an employee, stuff like that. Um, you can, wherever your site rules are, you might want to extra validation. They click OK, they get an email. Um, next time they go to the registration page, they may be redirected to the Shrine web client for convenience. You can use one URL um, that does, um, you can test if they're registered or not, and depending, it'll take them right to the Shrine web or to this registration page. So. Yeah, good, good question though, yeah. Yes. Yes, each time, each, yes. That's why we decided to try it. Um, to, but this, it, like I said, it's not, not mandated, but that's one way to do it. And we found this, this is very easy, um, even though they have to click, yes, I agree every time. Okay, another question. Um, is it possible, could you use, I'm just thinking, if we'd ever want to. So, okay, site has this set up, the user agrees to the terms of query access. Would it ever be possible to configure an additional pop-up like in case we have a network outage or a downtime or something else we want to advertise? Is there the ability to have two separate pop-ups or is it something that you would just have to configure? I don't know if so you everything else in, in that, right? Just in one box. Oh, like we can say all diagnoses are disabled today. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 and then like, yes, I agree. I, <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, it's possible to do, right? Like, it's, 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 it
And I assume it's being driven off the PM table, right? Yes. So the so there's a list of them. Yeah. So the, the in the project management cell, there's a parameters file which controls all of these announcements. And it's just a table with like you know uh, announcement and then the text. Right? So you could do all kinds of fancy things like automatically update the table, you know, across the entire shrine network, for example. Um, but that would be something that act would have to invent in order to get that into the table. And then once it's in the table, it appears like this. There's, all this is doing is just kind of digging it out of the table and putting it in the Wait, Good question. Um, So a couple of last uh, thoughts. Um, this is something we had to go through to make this production ready as far as uh, um, to let users in. And we wanted um, a HTTPS and SSL certificate. And um, you might have to work with your network engineering team or your network server engineers, or you may be doing most of it depending on, on your roles and at each site's unique. Um, and they'll say like, oh, is it inward facing or outward facing? And if it's inward facing, they'll be like, oh, you can use a wildcard um, certificate. I'm like, great, okay, that sounds good. Um, but just the thing is, is these things take time. So make sure you get everything done before you, you announce you go live. Uh, also, um, get a you may want to get a domain name server entry for your um, for your for your act shrine web client instance. Um, that way, your users have something easy to remember, or save it migrates to another machine. They just pointed the, the domain name to another machine, and the users don't even know it. And it's better than trying to remember an IP address. And that that usually um, a day or two, um, depending on your network engineering's um, load. Um, and then user user accounts can be tied to organizational accounts. Um, and we kind of covered that with, uh, with the code example above. Um, now, if you're doing it manually, like using the, the, the administrator, I2B2 administrator, make sure your Shrine users only have data arrogant and data limited data set. The code sample to ha uh, handles that for you. Um, so you don't, if you use the code as example, it won't give too many rights away. But if you're doing it manually, just something to think about. And yeah, that's, that's it. Any questions on this? Yes, sir. Yeah. Additional check, and that is to make sure that they have that all of their responsible conduct for research, all, all of their train, training is up to date, and we don't let them in if they haven't had that. Uh, as well, as you thought about doing anything like that? Um, here. That's that's brilliant. Now I don't I'm not, I'm not sure. So the registration example. Each login or just user registration? Currently, we do it on I2B2 on our login. It's actually a little bit of a funky process, but it, it does affect it. It works every night. Um, actually, the way it works is we go in every night and disable all the accounts, run a check 
uh, on our Active Directory for their training statuses, and then re-enable everybody that um, that has current training. And then we catch people because you have to have these annual refreshers and things like that. We catch people that want that out. That's really that's really great to share. Thanks. Um, just two points here on um, data refreshes uh, that you may be aware of. Um, the phase two software, with, uh, which is going to be discussed next by Boswati, um, in order for, for, for these plugins and this uh, phase two software to work, from each refresh, you need, we should keep your patient now cons consistent. Um, otherwise, historically, um, the patient, the, the patient viewer won't work. Uh, also, um, if there's any breaks in the data structure or on or ontology changes, previous queries will not work anymore. And that's all I have. Unless there's any questions. Yes, Texas. Lack the data elements referenced by the ontology that queries will break on your site if they can those. Has anyone um they tried just having all of the all of the concepts that they do not support just map to the same of um they have one null term that returns zero results that there might be two terms and then having all of their non-support. Which 
would give a very sort of nuanced answer to that person. I have a related question and just came up to me, so I've never actually looked to see how this is handled. In ITP2, there is a minimal threshold, right? So if you get a count, patient count small, it will return zero just because you didn't hit that minimal threshold. What it's trying to do is this, I, I just don't know, right? There's no cure. The magic number that's supposed to be there is minus one, and that is interpreted as ten to one, as opposed to fifteen plus or minus ten. Sure. So trying to then just return zero if I to be two returns. It looks like ten or fewer. Uh, we return ten or fewer. I guess uh, any more open discussion? <laughs> <laughs> well, we heard a couple of things. We, we heard from you know, Rob, for example, something that you know, Bergen's doing, but we're all, at least our wave one and two sites, you're in the middle of having to think through, like, okay, kind of a wake-up call, right? If the act was on hold for a little bit, you already went through your technical install, then you actually had to think about what it was like to function in a true production network, thinking ahead and you know, releasing to end users. So I know that you know, all of us, I speak for all of our wave one and two sites, but it's been a, it's been a, it's a lot more than just saying, hey guys, act's ready for you. So here's where you go to register, right? There was a lot that we had to think through before we were able to do that. So I think it's going to be helpful, you know, it's still our wave one and two sites and also our wave three and four sites if they're thinking ahead to this. You know, what were some of the, the areas that you had to consider that just weren't front of mind or what are some things that you found to be really useful as you're prepping to roll out to end users? Or where are there still gaps? Where are you really confused and you feel like you're just not clear on um, on how to do something and you know are a little bit hesitant before we roll out to end users? So I would love to hear from the, from the group. Or everyone has it down and nothing to worry about. This is on autopilot now. <laughs> Hello. I'm going to get ahead of my computer, but I'll go ahead and ask it anyways. Um, so, how does pharmaceutical companies be part of Trump? Because they're not data providers, right? But they do make use of clinical cohort exploration, which is Schwein is the part. Um, is there a, a plan in the future to make them as part of the stakeholders? No, not in the next couple of years. Yeah, not in the duration of this of this grant. Good question. Well, I think that, that yeah, there's a slightly grayer answer to that question. I like binary answers. <laughs> uh, certainly a pharmaceutical could approach uh, investigators. Um, and or the PIs of um, app and try to figure that one out. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. You know, I haven't built a door yet. You know, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to use this to end up for a personal question that I'm fighting through right now. So uh, we are in the process of figuring, we just set up a new IT for instance that we used to have a separate. We used to have things much more separated, but we're going to have the ITV2 instance serving both the Shrine, our internal users, and the, the Shrine network. Um, and wondering with LDAP authentication, because our goal is to have simple LDAP authentication for the uh, ITV2 instance, but then um, something a little bit more complicated for the Shrine instance. So when you set up that LDAP, authentication do the users just get you have user records created within the ITV2 um, user records and then you control that by project or um, what are the pitfalls I need to be looking for in the next month as I send this up? So um, think of LDAP as a very simple username password authentication protocol. All the authorization methods, you know, what project is the person in, what access do they have, you know, do they have limited data set access, you know, are they a manager? 
all of that is in a table in the project management cell. So that's all the same, whether it's LDAP or you know, a straight you know, type user advantage uh, username password. It's always all that authorization stuff is in project management cell of IP. And the only thing. Oh, sorry. Is there a way in like the admin um, menu to go in and say when someone authenticates with LDAP, set them up with this type of use, or is it yeah. I have to go in with each single user and give them the access that they should have? Uh, each single user, they won't be able to get into IP to LDAP or, or not until you put them in. Okay, when you put it in, you'll say LDAP. And then it'll know to go to LDAP to get the authorization, authentication. So okay. it's so just, just doing the authentication. I still yeah, need to make You're still doing all the Okay. There's nothing cool like take this LDAP group and say everybody. Mm -hmm. Nothing cool like that. So not okay. <laughs> That's what I was hoping for. So I guess I. Well. So, what's the same user technology, different privileges for. Project. You know, yes. 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 Yes.
You should have a map. Can you can you, you do you know how to do that? Can you tell us how to do that? Can you write it down? <laughs> <laughs> Is there any even looking? I mean, could we? Is there a way that we could configure the Shrine web content for landing page upon login with an app, just the app logo or something? Would that be sufficient just on the login page and a differentiator from ITV2? And then at least know where you're. We might use background color too. Oh, you change yours? In the Shrine app, you could change In related scenarios, yeah. So you could write it down. <laughs> yeah, and that'll be great because we all are struggling with like, I mean, I do it all the time and I have two different logins and the behavior is different. So, I would love to know. So, so he is, who is he? Conley. Dan Conley, can you write him down for <laughs> Yes. Okay, but it, but it sounds like, and, and yeah, we've, we've definitely heard this before. I've heard it, I think, primarily from Michelle every single time I'm begging Michelle for help with something. Um, so it sounds like if we, because this, this would all be done local, right? This would be local configurations for everyone to modify their, their web clients. So if we would agree. So we could do it. But could we do it just for app? Okay. That way, we whether it is background color or a logo or some sort of differentiator, so we can do that. And then, all right, maybe. And then maybe what we could do is the one of these upcoming shrine updates. It just comes with it. What do you think? Also, just sort of like an act specific distribution of the shrine. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Oh yes, correct. Yeah. I guess so I guess the most straightforward for instruction. <laughs> exist yet for ITV2 web client nor for the shrine web client but that exists in your version of the workbench is that right you know the ITV2 workbench so we are two uh clients 
what is the IT feature what behind them? What is the IT feature workbench and that workbench is going to be And that one does have it, but it's not fully done. It was uh because there was multiple developers working on it, so I'm not sure if everyone did the name value pay up for it. If you did localize it, it could be like half of it. So Mark, the, work, Mark, the workbench though I would only use in Windows, not in the Mac. Oh, not the Mac one. There's a I didn't know also the app was not okay. a plastic. All right, so we've talked a lot about history of ACT, what ACT is, what you can expect, what you're doing right now, 2018. Are there any other questions related to any of the discussion so far before we transition into the future? I don't know if this is probably time to give some of the other developers um, later on, but I had questions just about very low level, the best ways to, I mean, how do you choose what kind of hardware you want for your virtual machine, for example. Um, when we make, um, what about when I have I2B2, I need to go in and make adjustments to the .xml files before I deploy them into Wildfly. And do I want to put those under version control? Is this is there a, a recommended way of approaching that? And so I just have a number of questions as a developer and implementer about best practices for that kind of thing. Sure, so I know that Sam and Mark spoke a little bit to some of that during our webinar a week or two ago. I also know there's plenty of information on both respective wikis. And I would also recommend, I think most of the folks in this room um, wouldn't disagree that feel free to use the distribution list, the ACT Tech DH, if you just want to query out to the group and try to get an understanding as to what other sites have, have done and what's been useful for them. You'll at least get a couple of responses back, but I'll turn it over to the group for any additional, you know, places to go for some guidance and best practice. So I can lightly touch upon this can be taken offline for further discussion. For version and control, uh, as I mentioned before, I think Robert Bradford from UNC, they exclusively use Jenkins to deploy their software. So Jenkins has a template versioning system. So you make changes to uh, an XML file or a config file, it keeps track of that. And then you can basically slash and burn, you know, destroy your whole environment and then rebuild and redeploy everything. So that's a particular piece of software that you can utilize. Uh, we at HMS use Ansible uh, to deploy things uh, from local to cloud or local server. So uh, we also have version systems there. Uh, we link it to something like Bitbucket or GitHub. And so that's a good way to track changes made to your configurations or other files. Um, and then, you know, going down the line, you know, uh, a lot of sites are starting to explore container systems like Docker and stuff like that. And I think Docker Hub also has a versioning system as well. So you can utilize a whole variety of tools to uh, deploy your software or to make changes. And there are mechanisms for you to roll back in case something fails, you know. Uh, and then I think yesterday, um, Splunk was mentioned. So Splunk is like logging software. So that could be utilized in conjunction with these configuration management systems to troubleshoot errors or to basically log all of your activity. So, um, but yeah, as the way said, like, we can open this up to see what people are using at their particular sites and, um, you know, however we can make things more efficient or remove some pain points, that'll be good to hear from them. And also when we kick off with our wave four calls and we'll meet probably bi-weekly, we will have, you know, these wonderful folks that you've been hearing from today on the line as well. And, you know, partners can speak to what partners done, Pitt can speak to what Pitt has done. So hopefully that provides some, some guidance as well. Cool. All right, let's see here if we can turn it over to Aswati to talk to us about, um, I know we've we've mentioned a lot, Vivian's mentioned a lot about the plugins and participant identification. So now we're gonna hear all the fun details from Aswati and Vivian. Right, so as we promised, alluded to, intimated, 
threatened. <laughs> we're going to talk about phase two and we're going to talk about some new tools that are going to get people from phase one where you just have an aggregate account that's returned in the Shrine web client and now you're at your local site and you want to do something. So we already talked about these aims. I'm not gonna go over them again, but what I was gonna point out is that we're talking about aim three right now, enabling identification uh, locally. So here's my use case that I talked about this morning. That's taken a little bit further with Parkinson's and tobacco use. It's been studied for a while, and now it's at the level where a group in France was looking at the genes that are involved. And they actually found nine uh, SNPs. They, they ended up with 513 people who had Parkinson's disease and a bunch of controls. They found nine SNPs. They then were able to verify that two of the SNPs are significant. And so they want to go further. And they're not using ACT, but this is somewhere uh, that ACT could be, in a case like this, that ACT could be useful because they did state in their paper that they really needed more power and they needed, and they are going to do multi-site uh, trials with people across Europe. So we're using this as our use case today to kind of talk about our tools. And so we've talked about this a lot. We're in phase one. Right now, a PI can run a query and can get aggregate counts. And we showed this this morning. This is the query being run. These are the counts being returned. And uh, we thought, OK, if you need over 200 people at each site, then you have at least four sites that satisfy that criterion. And so now I'm going to hand it over to Baswati and she's going to tell you about these plugins that we've been working on. Thank you, Vivian. Good afternoon, everyone. So phase two, you have been hearing a lot about it all day and let's get to it now. What is it? Uh, so according to the Act software, here we are now in phase one. We have our Shrine and I2V2 installed. A PI or any act user can run a query that goes around all the sites connected and gets back the result as aggregated counts um, to the user. We are partners are making some plugins that will go on top of your um, I2V2 installation. And these I2V2 tools will help you identify potential research subjects. And when these, um, these plugins added on top of your I2B2 web class, this whole software day from phase one, this will move, this will enhance to phase two. The tools are able to do, they will help you find a network query locally. They will help you find local patients for those network queries. You can, you will be able to review and filter patients. And finally, you will be able to export the list of patients for recruitment. And uh, I'm going to explain them in my following slides. Um, but before that, let me discuss about flagging a little bit more. Um, so many of you may be already familiar with flagging feature in Shrine. It's, a, it's existing functionality helps you uh, label a query. Um, so as Vivian showed you, uh, the Parkinson and tobacco use um, query. PI running that. There may be a few attempts before he comes to the optimal one. Okay. Uh, I think Sean mentioned it before um, that the query criteria it cannot be too strict that you get so less uh, patients for your trial. You cannot uh, work with that. It cannot be too liberal, then you will get a lot of false positives. So it's necessary to get to the optimal one. And PI tries to get to that one. And when he or she is satisfied that this, this query uh, is the one that gives him sufficient patience for different sites that he's interested in, then he will go here in the previous query section in his Shine web client. It doesn't actually move. 
Okay, so he will go, he will find his uh, final query in the previous query section and right click on here and select plugin that will bring that dialog box. Now, the message there I put, it's very generic one, but a PI can put a very meaningful message there. And when he clicks OK, that meaningful message goes across all the app sites again so that the other app sites know that this is something they want to have. Uh, they want to work on, they have to take action on. And after the flagging is done, you can see the PI will see this icon here changes to this. That's an indication that the flagging has been completed. So after the flagging is done, there comes these uh, plugins, ITB2 plugins that users will use at their local sites. The plugins are trying to ITB2 uh, connector, patient reviewer, and patient list export. Trying to ITB2 connector. Sean mentioned about it. Uh, you saw uh, how it looks like. So this gives you a unique view into Shrine queries from being within your ITB2 web client. You don't have to uh, look through all the previous queries to find one. This, uh, this tool will help you. This will give you that unique view. And you will be able to find the network query that you are interested in. And you will be able to create a patient set using this tool. This is how it looks like. And Act is in, um, still developing the network. Uh, so when it's fully developed, there will be 60 plus websites, uh, 60 plus act sites. And so many, we believe it will be very busy. So many network queries coming in and running against your local site. So many flag messages and things. How will you find your query? This, is, this gives you a view into all flag queries and ordered in the, according to their time of execution. And not only the created a time and the name that you already can see in previous queries, but it will give you an idea about who actually ran the query and from which side. If the domain name of the shrine site was set up properly, you will be able to see that, yeah, BG845 ran a query from PH partners. And there goes the flag comment. If you're not sure um, um, if you were looking for a flag or unflagged, go ahead. There is this checkbox, if you uncheck it and click start again, this will bring all the queries um, that were flagged or unflagged. You will look, if you know what query you are looking for, uh, to provide the name there, or if you know which user you just put there and start it, it will bring you, it will help you pinpoint the query. So the user ID is now passing through the user from the Shrine site? Um, Instead of it showing the service account, it's showing the actual right, right. User. So yeah, you cannot. This is the only tool that will give you this information. This information is there, but you need some expert to give you that information. But this tool gives you all this information at your disposal. Yeah, there is no other tool in ITV2 right now that does this. Uh, uh, this is a list of flag queries in the network. Mm -hmm. Is this available to any user at any site? Uh, no, this, this is, depends on how much access you have. So user, ITV user needs a manager role to get to this. Yeah. Okay. So once you can point what query you are interested in, you will click on view and run. And this is a query you saw PI ran into in his Shrine web client, and now it is into your ITB2 web client. And I will just quickly mention about this work list here that differentiate between, I know people are thinking about color coding and different things, but this little section here, this only belongs to ITB2 web client. It, it's not present in Shrine web client. Anyways, so now it is here in your web client, in your ITB2 web client, and there is a prompt that was returned as a result of the query. And at this point, it's still just an aggregated count. You need actual patients to work with. How to do that? It's easy. You just hit the run query button there. You have to basically read on this query in your ITV2 work client, in your ITV2 environment again. So when this uh, dialog pops up, check on the patient set and run it again. 
When you run it, the patient set will be generated. It will create a new query for you, and you will be able to find it here again in the previous query section. And you'll see the name, whatever name you put there, you will see that name, and the new patients will be attached to uh, that. So using ITV2, uh, shrine to ITV2 connector, now from an aggregated count, you have come to an actual set of patients. Okay, what's next? So, you know, even the PI tries his best to come to the optimal query, there are still chances that there are some false positive. Uh, so many times a patient goes to run a test just to rule out a condition, but because that test was run, it stays in his medical uh, record and chances are that he shows up in uh, related queries. So there will be still uh, false positive and wouldn't it be nice if you could look into the patient's data one patient at a time and make sure yeah that patient makes the criteria or does not. Patient set, uh, patient reviewer plugin is meant for that. It will help you review the patients in a tabular structure of data, one patient in a row, and it will help you filter out those who you think do not meet the criteria. This is how patient reviewer plugin looks like. It has four sections. The first section uh, helps you uh, structure the um, in the format in which you want to see your patient's data. So um, you will just drop your uh, the query that you created your, in your uh, previous example using the shrine to activity connector, and then you will be able to structure it the table tabular format. Uh, you can you will be able to download the patient's table. I'll tell about it a later um, a little bit. Uh, you will be able to designate a workplace. So what is workplace folder? Um, when you review the patients, you need to save them somewhere. Where will you save them? So workplace folder will help you with that. And then um, the last section will actually show you the patient's data. So this is how it looks like when you drop your uh, query. You drop your query, it brings the concepts associated with it. And in addition, we also give you some extra uh, de uh, details that we thought would be meaningful for you for these uh, review purposes. So it says Parkinson's disease, and then it says existence. Means what? That it's checking if this concept is present for this uh, patient, for the patient. Well, we already know there, yes, right? That's why they showed up. So that's not sufficient. Only looking for existence is not sufficient. So this tool also gives you some analytical tools too. We are giving you a bunch of aggregation options that you can choose from. Uh, like count will be very important in this case. The, count, the higher the count, chances are probably the patient actually has this condition. And as you can see there, you can look uh, for when it was the first time the patient ever was diagnosed with this condition, what was the last time, all different kind of ag aggregation this tool is providing you. Okay. Okay. Um, so here, what I'm showing, you do not have to your the data that you are reviewing. You do not have to be constrained within the only uh, uh, concepts that were associated with the original query. You can drag. Uh, you can explore these ontologies that Michelle one is working on, and you can find any uh, ontology that you think will help you with the re review process. You could drag and drop in here in the concepts dialog box right there and that will add that concept and then you can go ahead and choose any aggregation options that are available for that. So this gives you a lot of flexibility what your review data will look like. And this is the workplace again. Um, uh, I created um, under my workplace folder I created this Parkinson tobacco study just for this example. So if you are working with a clinical trial you will go ahead and create a a workplace folder for yourself and just drag it to there. And that's, that's done, it's selected. And when you select some patients, it will be saved right inside that folder. And then when you hit the last area, this is how patient data looks like. It brings on 50 patients at a time. And uh, you can see all the data that you asked for. There's my um, the anti-Parkinson agent concept that I added, it brings on the even the dosage for the patient, depending on what uh, concept I had, uh, what aggregation I had chosen. 
Uh, there are the accounts that I asked for, and then there's the date. Well, I go ahead. 34 looks a good count. Just select it by clicking here. Another count. Okay, I selected here. Let's move to the next page, which is 51 to next 50 set of 50 patients. I go ahead and select it. Uh, select two more patients. And as you, in real time, as you keep checking on more and more patients, you will see them being added to the office folder that you just had selected. This is where they are being selected. If you accidentally selected one you really don't like, go ahead and uncheck it. It will be taken care of from here too. Now, all this review process till now, it was all real time. You do not have that time, no worries. This is, this uh, download uh, functionality will help you. You go ahead here and download the patient patient table. What this does, it brings all patient data, not just 50 at a time, it brings all patient data into the tabular structure that you had chosen before, and you, you can save it on your computer, work on it at some later time at your convenience. So now we have a network query from, down from indication count, we have a more precise set of patients related for a trial. What's next? It's, you need to extract the patient identification. How will you contact, contact them unless you have their identifier? The patient list exporter helps you with that. And very simple, how it looks like, it gives you two options, um, two options for selecting your patient set. You could either use your precise, uh, more precise set that you just created using patient reviewer, or if you thought the other, um, the PI query was fine and what patient set was there, you are good with that. You just go ahead and select that query from the video section and you hit download patient list. And then the magic happens. <laughs> Depending what you have uh, in your database, of course, and uh, how much level of access you have, you will be given some or all of this uh, information provided to you. And there you go, you have patient's name, street address, give them a call. <laughs> I don't know how you want to uh, recruit them, but we give you everything you need uh, using these tools. Yes. Okay. So, uh, we have a lot of questions. Uh, I was wondering, for first, did you plug in, do you check for IRB or RP, uh, RPR? Yeah, that's what I talked about, how much level of access um, you have. That's not really up to us. It's uh, with the um, governance team, I guess. Right, yeah. so what we proposed from a workflow standpoint is that before you'd ever get to this information locally, you would have, you'd have a study and you'd have IRB where you'd ever actually go to this level of detail. Um, that is the one workflow that we are proposing at this point. It's sort of what I want to say. It makes sure that this process is only done by an honest broker of some sort and that it is not done by the investigator or herself. Um, but we are assuming, at least for now, that you know that it's it's a study, it's an approved study, and there's IRB approval before you actually get down to the identifier level. You don't have to have IRB approval to get this. Yeah. yeah. In, in, our, in our version, what we do is that when they when they actually click on the we we ask them to enter our IRB or RPR number, and we have a mechanism that we are able to check if it is a valid IRB. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
So yes. oh, very good question. Oh, question oh, is, where do you put names in ICD? So um, in theory, right, you can put names in the fact table just like anything else. Mm -hmm. Yep. But um, that's not very ICD to like. So in order to actually make uh, this ICD to like, we actually have a number of enhancements to do for uh, uh, 1.7.11, which includes um, things like, uh, so if you, uh, you can, you can in theory, and the slide might be about the children, but I don't want to say it's not there. It's the last slide. Oh, it's the last slide. Oh, the last slide. <laughs> so in other words, so you, can, you can do things like make this report by dragging over, you know, first name, last name, street, right? Just like any other I2B2 fact. And then, but what about all those folks that don't have access to this, number one, okay? And so we don't want them to even see that it's even already there. So hiding that completely from them on a, on a kind of is, is one uh, enhancement we have to make. So you can't even see a tree if you don't have certain permissions. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is, um, we don't even want this in. So what we want to do is use the multi-fact table strategy to put this in a totally different fact table that could live on a totally different server. And that way, uh, uh, anybody who sees your regular ITV tool will not even see this stuff. It will only come in dynamically you know, during, the, during this query process. Um, can't we operate on two different because we have our university and our UBMC is both separate, we actually don't have real time connectivity to um, names. So we have like all of our identified stuff lives in UBMC and only on a desktop is fully unidentified. So I would have to write into the software to take this list, move it to UBMC, and then re identify. Right, there's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. exactly right. Uh, and, and just like Alex is, was, wanted, so in that case, all I to be to do is spit out those so patient noms, just the blue column. Mm -hmm. Everything else it doesn't even know about. Right. And then in your next step, yeah. you would add the other stuff to it. Right. Yeah, I have a question about the step that involved pretty early on when you first uh, uh, bring out the flagged query of interest, uh, and you show the result count 250. Yeah, that one. Uh, yeah. So, this one? Uh, no, this one. That one. Uh -huh. So, at that point, I've now clicked on the prior screen. That query is now loaded into my local ITV2, correct? Mm -hmm. This is in your, yeah. The this 251 is that's displayed there is the result of the query that's run. In and try and try and use yeah and the PI so I agree um like obfuscated count there it could be like 250 plus sure yeah plus minus yeah and is it also true that what just came over is only a query definition and not a patient set correct correct so, so here's a, and, and so what I'm doing this locally and now I'm rerunning that query mm -hmm. okay so here's my question is my local I2B2 instance I'm probably going to have more patients there than I am going to have in my act instance. And because the primary use case and the sole use case is accrual of clinical trials, so I'm going to exclude people who are known to be deceased out of act. I don't want to recruit um, deceased sure. folks. Mm -hmm. For example, there may be other other reasons too, but I can't mm -hmm. think of it at the moment. My question is, when I rerun that query in this local instance, and rather than getting more data about the 251 that were collected in ACT, I'm actually going to get a different patient set. Yeah. Um, if it's only vital status that changes that number, that's probably okay. I'm wondering if that was an explicit design decision not to bring over a patient set. So, okay, multiple people covers up the question in your question. Yeah. 
So the first one is, um, are you sure you don't want to use your app instance? Also, for as the I2V2 instance behind folks doing this patient selection process. Are you sure, you know, because you, you could arrange it that way, right? That's now let's say you feel like, you know, I want to use, don't want to do that. I want to you know, put them in to the main I2V2 instance. And in that case, um, there was a design decision to allow folks to add stuff from their local I2B2 uh, ontology, recognizing that they might have far more in their local I2B2 than is in their app. Um, both patients and uh, uh, stuff, right, about the patients. Yeah. So that then you can use, you know, all the stuff about your patient to help either add to the set or subtract from the set, you know, to get a better starting point. Um, so that was, so the answer is that, that yes, that, that was a design decision uh, that we made. Uh, now you're right that it could get pretty complicated. Yeah, our particular deployment has two separate I2B2 instances. Yeah, one that powers act and one that is our local instance. The reasons for that decision are that every place is like that. So how do they interact with each other? What's that? How do they interact with each other? They do not interact. There, there are two separate instances. How are you getting the query from your app one into your local one? Uh, I thought that's what that plugin did. No, it's, it's doing it on your on the same the act I two B two. Act I two B two. So when you say go to your local I two B two. That's your act local I two B two. It's the I two B two screen of your. Okay. Local site. Web client. Web client. I can give you web client instead of the shrine web client. Okay. 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 Just a shallow app site that is what we were thinking. Exactly what she said. Yeah, he was over. But I'm just thinking, okay, but cool. she did try to do it. It's going to change all the things. It's the services from the tribe. I see a new app. I see a new plugin in the RPG. I think you guys should see. It's going to be laterally across all your RPGs. So in our case, you would not be able to use this plugin directly because we haven't enhanced our, our app instance of I2B2. That's just the act ontology of it. That's right. Um, that's right. Um, that's right. Um, if you're two ITP2 instance and then inject the ontology, right? You have to raise the ontology. You have to raise the ontology. You have to raise the ontology. You have to do that. So you can take that query and export it, you know, select it out and then put it into your other database. But it's going to make an assumption that the paths are going to work on the other ITP2. That's going to be your problem. Yes, that's, and I do have that problem. <laughs> 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 so, so Shell could actually fix that problem for you by just putting the concept of it through our policy and that concept. Somebody will use it as an ontology, but it'll be the concept of it. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. But it sounds like a good one. Frankly, when we start talking like this, there's so many that it's too complicated a solution. <laughs> Bell goes off, right? Yeah. And the idea is just using the act ontology instance everything to do this whole workflow. Yeah. Means, you know, that's we have more data yes. to do in that case. So what are you saying you don't put all your data into your app instance? Correct. Our, uh, there were some reasons for early on when so we had our I2B2 instance for like quite a while. Mm -hmm. We made some early ontology decisions when uh, demo data was really supposed to be a demo ontology and we made some decisions like, oh, age is numeric. We're not going to categorize age. We're going to have it be a numeric selector and use the uh, little XML oh, no, uh, uh -huh. So we have things like that. The mapper didn't work um, in the case of moving kind of a continuous variable into categories. So our decision when we implemented ACT rather than redoing all of our ontology locally, it was easier then, maybe not now, to just stand up a separate instance for ACT and have only 
the data elements that were part of the act ontology in that separate I2B2 instance. So I've got basically two I2B2s. It was easy. Well, I think we were set up. Copy, cut, and paste. Yeah. Oh, it's a good time for us to relook at that because we, for other reasons, have to reduce the DTL. So um, perhaps that's not the best design pattern now. <laughs> we have another question. Another question. Okay. Well, I have kind of odd questions. So, um, for shy ontology, you have, is it, is it the case that you cannot have dynamic, um, um, dynamic concepts? Like it has to be like or equal, right? There can't be any other relationship. Um, um, for, 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 for the um, fat table, right? So, for the concept of Right. It has to be like or equal. Okay. That is correct. Um, for the dimension tables, then it can be anything, right? It can be all kinds of different kinds of things. Yeah, the ontology table, right? But actually, it is quite Okay. So it says what tables call another one about the table, the column, and then the SQL potential. Exactly. That's exactly right. you're, you're, you're all there. <laughs> so, uh, so absolutely. So, so the ontology tables are really capable of writing their own SQL. Often we don't take advantage of that, uh, but uh, and we just make uh, everything a value or a tool, like you said, in the. Um, so we use the concept dimension to grab all the code and put it together with the fact table. And the reason is it's just really fast. So we have really big dimension, you know, you have huge categories, they have thousands of code, it's still like super fast, right? In the dimension table, we often do take advantage of the query construction capability to do things like um, either, you know, uh, derive the birth date from derive the age from the birth date. So you know you don't have to update every time so we do that real quick. Or we do the join it with the encounter so that it becomes the uh, age of visits. Thank you. Yes, exactly right. Age of visits. So you can do that, but just to answer your question more specifically directly, you are correct. Really in the dimension in the back table, really the options are working against the dimension table. Uh, the concept of that school is like or equal. So the question was actually like before they did that. Um, we can't do any of that in uh, for purposes of a shrine ontology, right? We we, we cannot when it's always going to be just matches. It's that it's we can't do any of the dynamic stuff, right? I don't know, whatever so, so, does. Well, 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 remember the shrine ontology is basically turning everything into a path. So if on your I2B2 side, you're doing something fancier, that's fine. But the shrine ontology is always going to send path, you know, even if it's agent visit, it's still just sending that path across to the adapter mapping file. And then your local ontology is actually the thing that's doing the work. Um, so it sounds it sounds like you're saying that you can try, you know, like whatever demographic uh, you know patient level information you want mm -hmm. in, in you know in, in your plugin and, and eventually of course and eventually you know, mm -hmm. people are building you know, patients. Um, um what prevents you from, from taking a, a a temporal value like like a lab value uh, that a patient is likely to have multiple uh, ones of over multiple dates? How will that be represented in the table? Basically, you can. You can. You can uh, drop any lab values here too. It's just for this example I use that. Okay. If you have an example, you can drop a table. She had two ways. I think she had one that count, which is counting multiple instances of it. 
And then I think when you look at that drug, it looks like she's doing something a little more. I brought out the concept. So there's a limited number of options for specific programs. It's an expanded program that we'll see. Um, that's value, and then all values. Well, I'm using labels just an example to guys the relationship to a patient. So, but, but in the South, you'll be in the end of the one row of the patient, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's the key simplifying attribute of this table. If you're getting one row per patient, you can imagine lots of other things, you know, one encounter per row and so forth, one time period per row. But most Interestingly enough, most um, calculations, machine learning calculations, want this. For whatever reason, that's how things are done. So it's like you do the aggregate. Now, some of these aggregates could be over a time period, right? You could say these Parkinson's disease count, you know, for you could have a column for every year, for example, right? Um, so it did, it did. Yes, it did. Exactly. If you just yeah. click there, it will, it will give you option to narrow your search but um but this but humans and then their ability to program machines seems to really focus down on this you know very simplified kind of thing just like you said now um sometimes you do need to pull in scale right and um actually dave is working on that in a way that humans like to look at um, uh dave wang is working on that because humans like to look at that detail in a timeline Right, and you kind of hover around the timeline. That, that's really nothing but a bunch of facts, right, laid out with what a timeline is. So that's the way to do a timeline. But for 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 patients, uh, for for this kind of aggregate data, this one over per patient, very natural for people to understand that. And a, a common starting point for machine learning. Any questions? Any question? Yeah, <clears throat> Wayne back to the the question of more than one i2b2 um, one is for act one is for your local i2b2 uh, but this gentleman over here pardon me for pointing um suggested that there's a you know, i2b2 that supports a single instance of, of that that supports both local web client and the act network and so i'm wondering is it is it true that we can have like a separate project in I2B2 so to support ACT and a separate project to support our local I2B2 where you know you have your CRC data and ontology for ACT but a separate CRC data and ontology to support the local I2B2s on a single instance. I can't remember is that something that you should be able to do or not be able to do? You should. You should be you able should. to do that. I think his is the, the more difficult one because he has these two. Mm -hmm. CRCs, but I think a lot of people have the one CRC and different clients pointing to different. No, I was talking about two different CRCs for two different projects. Each CRC has its own, and its own ontology, but they're both within the same I2B2. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Draw that picture for me. <laughs> you can have one. Yeah, <laughs> 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 You can have one year around to that in that last grant, but you can actually carry on projects in that column. So you can say for all projects, the default CRC URL is this, but for this specific project, the default C you know, the post posting on it can see that you have the trial ones. So you'll actually see if you look at your PM cell table, you'll see that there's a ISBC CRC URL for all your ISBC projects, but specifically for the trial project. Different URL, and that's the really the URL of your adapter. Mm -hmm. That's how it kind of drives proxies in the training. Okay, uh, follow on question to that. Um, uh, one, so of these different uh, implementation patterns, is 
is there one or a small number of them that's considered a best practice? B, uh, if the answer to that is yes, what is it? C, if the answer is no, um, are there sort of a collection of, or, or sort of any uh, documentation, white papers, if you will, about um, a handful of different implementation patterns, their pluses and minuses and, and, and such that would oh, that would be What might be a good use case for a particular pattern? Yeah, yeah. I think Doug and Mark I mean, so actually out of the box. Um, and um, and it works, you know, like eighty percent of the time. Um, but there's a lot of special cases, you know, where people want to do special things with their own ITV2. I think there's a lot of merit to, you know, despite the fact that I was kind of saying, okay, the simplest thing for you to do is press the cloud, use the uh, app, yeah. you know. There's a lot of merit to having, when you get down to the actual patient selection part, having all the data available, you know, mm -hmm. and all the ontology that you have available, you know. Okay. So, um, so there's reasons for complexity. Some kind of guide like that would be super useful for the community. Well, it kind of depends on how much time and resources you have, too. Like, how many of these things you want to juggle? Exactly. The magic formula? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we all want to juggle as few as possible. Uh, yeah. in, in, our, in, in our, no, but in, in our, uh, in our sphere, we have more than one hospital whose data we want to serve. And there's more than one, there's more than one shrine network that we want to be a part of. So we'd, we would like to, you know, combine as, as, a, uh, as many resources that we can, but of course, there's limitations on that. And so, um, but as much as we, we want to keep it into a minimum naturally, because everything you spin up costs money and it's another, it's another VM to, uh, to maintain. So. Now, there was somebody on one of these calls, I think, that was using views to spin up like for different networks. Children's, yeah. How does that work? Who is that? Somebody said we. Yeah, So you type a word, and then when you do the query, it searches what call is that? Um, what you call it? Um, text. Text. text care. So uh, that is in the new ontology. It'll have that little backup searchability thing. So if you, you search the blog, not the, I don't. Because you do the blog. Okay, I find in the text care field. Right. So that's why I think that was the text care field. Right. So, care field. Yeah. so you would be able to use that if you. Now, um, I know we're here, but there's a meeting in here at four, so I don't know how much time we have to present. So, 
So this is maybe more of a workflow question here. So the, the data export. So it's very likely that uh, any clinical trial or model type is going to take some time to recruit their patient. So if you may want to do model for export, please refresh your data. So you may have new patient that, that meets the criteria of a patient that so far because they, they, they take on new medication or something. Is there a start about instead of a, having a user to have to compare the export outcome every time to maybe ability to mark these are the new patients and these are the patients that are no longer qualified as long as the previous cohort. Does that make sense? I think there's a lot of complexity in that question. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. So so uh, Thanks, you can and so <laughs> when, you, when you do the selection of a patient, it does we mark the ones and it'll persist. So if you do a new query and you get some new, some old patients, it knows like who you can. Oh it does, yeah. Okay. So it'll it'll basically let's say you get half new patients, like roughly every other patient will be already checked off if you went through them, mm -hmm. but it'll have the new patients in there. Mm -hmm. You can start working on that. And the beauty of this is that so I think that was the importance of that Jay mentioned that you should in each data refresh the patient, keeping the patient numbers the same is important. Same. But the great thing about it is because you're working with the workplace, uh, that's why I demonstrated that you can create you know folders. So you can create a folder for like excluded patients, right? You can create a folder for like potential patients. And so as you're working or is it, you know, one, of, one of the options is to pick a folder you're working on. So one day you might work on just excluded patients and you select that excluded folder and you'll see all the check marks. And then once you do a data refresh, you can always select and see that those are the things you're doing. Well, this is not my question, but my and I'm going to ask this question. Would it be possible so that every time you refresh the data on, 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 on a certain way, a uh, regular interval, it will be run those queries? Phase three. <laughs> 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 sorry, right. That's right. Yeah, exactly. I have another question. Okay. Um, sorry, but to jump in here, but I have to ask this because this is an I2B2 transport symposium, right? So, I2B2, we have to install this for app. But can we install I2B2 slash transport? Oh. <laughs> My understanding is that you can uh, put I2B2 transpond because I2B2 is just sitting there, and the I2B2 transpond is like a giant plug. And so, my understanding, unless there's like some details that you know, that you know, could be right. My understanding is that you could do I2B2 part of I2B2 transpond to the shrine stuff. And then you would have the trans bar part available to work against that instance of I2B2 that's in, you know, in that whole. So, so it's as long the as I2B2 version compatible with Shrine that's in the I2B2 transport. It just happens to be. Happens to be. In trans, I2B2 transport is 092. Okay, so there you are. Let's do that. I feel the next Shrine update <laughs> requires. <laughs> <laughs> But that is, that's a very important uh, thing driving for for over time. Okay, as I showed you the plugins, how easy they are to use. We also thought of ease of installation, so the installation uh, is as painless as possible. And one option we are going to provide you is Docker. We will have a Docker hub where you can ex um, extract uh, these plugins from, and when you run some scripts, um, you will have a fully functional web client, ITV2 web client that will have the, uh, these all three plugins preloaded into it, and it will be less than five minutes of installation. And if you're wondering when you're going to get a hold of these wonderful plugins, in 2019, Web 1, Web 2, Web 3 are going to get them, and Web 4 will have to wait a little further. And if you cannot absolutely wait to use them, guess what? We need volunteer testers. <laughs> <laughs>
if you're interested, please let us know. We'd love to help you. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Bhatti. And that's it for today. Thank you guys so much for spending the day with us and for all of your work towards everything we do for the ACT Network. I know we have some representatives from our various work groups here, and I know all of you and your work and just onboarding and maintaining um, ACT to our specs. It's just, it's really awesome. So thank you so much. And a huge thank you to the wonderful folks you heard from today. So our network ops and support team. So Sam and Mark, guys, stand up. And Nitch and Maswati and Vivian and Jay and Michelle, these folks make all of this possible and they, they work really hard to make sure you have the support that you need to be a participating um, ACT institution. So thank you guys very much. Thank <laughs> you.